You know, I have a lot of uh, very interesting friends. And if you have lots of interesting friends, you have to make sure what their hobbies are. And I make sure that I have at least a few friends whose hobbies include something sweet. So I have uh, these friends who make amazing cake, chocolate cake specifically. So when you go to their house, it's a problem. Now what's the problem? Because after dinner, this is what you are likely to see. This friend invites me home, serves dinner, and then it's time for dessert. He brings out the first cake, and geez, why is it going right back? I'll, I'll do this. Brings out this cake and says, would you like this? And I say, of course I do. And then his wife chips in and says, oh, wait, that's not the one I made. This is what he baked. Here is what I made and brings out the second one. The moment you have this, you have a problem, right? And you have a problem because you have to exercise one of the two methods by which you have to make choices. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about. You can either make choices based on the OR method, in which case you have to choose between this or that. Or you can choose actually with the AND method, in which case you have both. So my preference has always in life been to focus on the AND model of doing things. So what is the AND model? The big difference between the two models is the OR method actually looks at things in silos. You have things in different chunks. There's no connection between them. Whereas if you think like an AND person, then in which case you see connections between all the things which others miss. For example, if you ever had to grow up listening to the music on the radio, you realize that as someone said, at that point of time, music was a collectively enjoyed piece. There was something that was common. It came from the radio. And you had to wait for your favorite song. You were never sure whether you would get it or not. Of course, you had the other option. You could always buy a record player, buy the records that you want. But there was a problem with that too. Because you would buy a record which had, say, 12 songs. And what if you liked only one of them? You still have to buy all 12. If you didn't have money, then you waited for option two, which is you prayed that when that song would be played, you would have your radio on. We've all seen this kind of a scenario many a times. But then there are people who actually think with that and mentality and then say, why don't we think differently? And here is what the and people really try to do. They would say, and thinking would be, what if I could buy just this one song? And we all recognize that person there. Steve Jobs actually turned back and asked this whole question, why should I be paying for an entire album when I like only one out of those 12 songs? And that what if question, that what if question came after he observed the problem and he redefined the problem. He said, what if I could just buy that one thing and that led to the creation of the iTunes store? Or for that matter, when you think of another option, another example of and thinking is, you start to say, what if I can carry my entire music collection wherever I go? And as you know, when you start to ask questions like that, you make inventions. That's exactly what he did. The invention really was the iPod. The, the beauty of the prism of possibilities is when you make one invention, you don't stop. You actually continue after that and keep refining it. So the next piece obviously was this other dimension. He said, what if I really created something which not only had my music, but a lot of other things? So the real thought behind an and person is that and person is always curious. An and person is always looking at possibilities. An and person always tries to redefine that whole problem. The OR person tries to answer the problem, the AND person tries to redefine the problem, and here is what eventually happened. Steve Jobs wanted to ask himself, what if I created something which actually not only made me connect with friends, AND gave me music, AND made me watch films, AND I could read my books on it, I could get maps on it, 
and a whole lot of other things. It could work as a fitness instructor. The moment you start thinking of and, you will realize that the world around you is inadequate. Because the world around you has not always made those connections. So that is the possibility that and thinking throws up. You take a scenario and pass it through the prism, break it into different components and ask yourself, why is it that such a possibility does not exist? And anytime you find a problem, realize that the problem is an and possibility. A problem is an opportunity for you to sit back and ask yourself, if this has not been done as yet, it means between what I want and what reality is, there is a gap. And that gap is the opportunity for invention. When you think of and thinking and and thinking people, there are and thinking companies, which actually start off creating something and then go on to add many more dimensions. You look at a company like Alphabet, uh, the erstwhile Google, and you ask yourself, what does a search engine have to do with creating contact lenses which give people the opportunity to tell them what their blood sugar count is? So for doing this, they tie up with a pharmaceutical company. So it's not just search engines, it's search engines and something else. And now they are making cars. So it's search engines and cars and contact lenses and hot air balloons. And they are, uh, you know, doing research on how do you extend human life. There are many more dimensions that they work on. The opportunity to be an and person exists with everyone. Of course, you can also choose to be an or person. There's nothing wrong with that. All people actually become specialists. They take one particular field and decide to go all out for it and become deep specialists. But as far as I'm concerned, I've always looked at myself as an and person. Because for me, any one thing does not hold my interest forever. I have to look for that variety. I have to try something different. And so I decided to enter a field which in itself was an and field, training and development. You have both. So the opportunity to try out all of that meant that I could also experiment and bring in further ands in my life. So you sort of start by, how do you build that connection? How do you become an ant person? The first step is, start making random connections. There is this Japanese art called chindogu. Now what chindogu does is, it really literally translates to meaning useless inventions. Today, when you go back, Google up that word, and you will see some amazing pictures. You will see amazing pictures. This is just one example of somebody who wants to clean the floor, does not want to bend down, and decides that they want to attach a duster and a place to scoop it up on the shoe. Look for Chindogu shoes, and you will see how many different ways shoes can be modified. It's just limited by your imagination. Someone has actually got shoes which give reverse footprints, which means the heel gets printed in front here and the foot gets printed on the other way around. You ask this person, what was that for? And the person says, what if I wanted to cover my tracks? Every time I went like that, people would actually walk the other way away from me. So it's a question of redefining a problem. Chindogu does not only that, but there are a lot of other things. And sometimes you really ask yourself, maybe there is an opportunity that someone has missed. I remember a friend of mine who wore uh, glasses, and those of you who wear glasses will identify with this, said that every time I go out into the rain, you know, my glasses get misty and I find it difficult to see. What if I had wipers on top of that? Many of you must have thought of it. Yet, you haven't done it. The opportunity to be an and person is, and you don't wait. You do it because that's the opportunity you have to take before somebody else finds it. The second part of an and mindset, to build an and mindset, you actually think of combining possibilities. Look at, look at the kind of things that you can combine. Let's take sports. You have gaming platforms like Kinect, right? And you see lots of kids, most of you may have played uh, with this Kinect version at some point of time or the other, and you actually have to, wow, well, you have to move your, excuse me, I think the, you just put that back. In Connect, what you really need to do is you have that screen in front, and as you are moving your 
hands, you're waving it back and forth, you actually land up moving the images on screen. So now, who would use that? The opportunity is actually limited only by your imagination. One fine day, the engineers from Microsoft discovered that there were people using this, you know, in their old age homes. Why was that happening? They discovered that there were some stroke patients, and these stroke patients actually had to do their daily exercise. And most of them were reluctant to do their exercise, like most of us are. Nobody likes to exercise, neither did these stroke patients. But what happened was, once they had that connect put in their living room, all these guys used to stand up and for hours together they would do that, and they found their recovery much faster. The opportunity for an and thinking person is just that you are limited by your imagination. Instead of that young person, change it to the opposite. Think of a completely different demographic. How would a student use it to study? How would a doctor use it to treat patients? How would a person use it to travel around the world? The moment you put a what-if question, you can actually find an opportunity for an invention. The prism of possibilities actually lies in utilizing not just one part of your brain, but both parts of your brain. There is lots of talk around the fact that today there are going to be opportunities for robots. And the previous speaker also said that robots are going to replace human beings because everything that is possible to be done with the left brain, anything which is logical, can actually be done by robots and machines much cheaper, quicker, faster, better. The moment you have that opportunity, what are human beings going to be doing? Well, human beings will still be required, A, to design those machines, and B, to be able to use the humanness even more. The prism of possibilities really tells us that even as lots and lots of things will get done by machines and through artificial intelligence, the opportunity for the humanness does not go away. The opportunity for humanness lies in that intersection of technology and design. How do you take high-tech and how do you use design, which is a totally different dimension, and combine both of them to solve problems. The things that you use today that delight you, every time you use a fascinatingly well-designed piece of furniture, every time you use a fascinatingly well-designed piece of um, machinery, you're actually looking at somebody who's combined both of them. The opportunity to combine left and right is not just It's also with combining disciplines. You look at combining the rational and the irrational. You have disciplines that have come up which are based on the fact that how do you combine two different disciplines and create a third one? Look at Daniel Kahneman, one of the Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologists. Actually, he's got his Nobel Prize in 2002 in the field of economics. He's actually credited with creating a completely different discipline called behavioral economics. What did he really do? He took the discipline of psychology, which gave us an insight about how people do what they do and why they do it. He took economics, which talks about how money motivates people or how do people make decisions rationally. He took the rational part of it, he took the irrational part of it, combined it and asked people, if everybody was supposed to do stuff which is rational, why do people know what is good for them and still do it differently anyway? A good example of that is smoking. Have you ever known that a person smokes because he or she is unaware that smoking is bad? No, it never happens like that. Every pack actually tells you smoking is injurious to health. So anyone who tells you that, well, it's a rational choice, I've thought about it, is actually falling into that area of behavioral economics which says you know what is right for you and you still don't do it. This kind of a possibility combines not only with subjects, but today, when you combine these subjects, it's leading to a very interesting problem, which is that even a prize like Nobel Prize is getting confused because you are having to give it to people who combine many different disciplines. Discovery of the DNA, you know, that double helix format that we are so familiar with, actually is a good example of and thinking. You have two people, two different disciplines, two different continents, two different mindsets. They use these two lenses that they had to bring out a third dimension and which actually led to the discovery of the DNA helix. There's an American biologist and there's a British physicist. When you combine these two perspectives, you actually get to see possibilities that others don't.
Today, when any of the companies sit down and design, all the award-winning stuff that you see have all been designed by multidisciplinary things. What does it really mean? It means that the world is actually moving towards a scenario where we are going to have all kinds of possibilities existing. And thinking actually tells us, you have to first believe that everything can be learned. When you were born, there was nothing that you knew. You didn't know how to walk, you didn't know how to talk, you couldn't even turn yourself. But you learned everything. And that is the amazing thing that, that's the amazing thing that science tells us, that everything that you see people doing around you, you can learn it. And if you work at it, you can actually be very, very good at it. I started applying this principle to chase one of my dreams, which was I wanted to write um, a book. I had never written a book, and I wanted to actually try that out. The only thing I had written was I, I used to write a lot of letters to my grandparents. My grandparents used to actually, um, you know, take those uh, stories that I would write when I traveled around. Uh, I would write to them, and they would actually take these letters, and my grandmother would keep it in a little folder. She would, you know, put them there, and when people would come in, she would read out little sections which she would mark and say, this is a really funny one, this is a sad one, this is this. And at one point of time, she just made a statement, why don't you write a novel? Put all these things together. That was actually the first time somebody had suggested that idea. And I thought, wow, I mean, how do you write something like this? Because I had only written something which is one page long. I'd never written something which actually went beyond that. So she said, why did you try writing short stories? I tried that and it would really didn't work. You know, I was not good at it. Then she said, write something different. Many years later, she passed away. I forgot about that entire thing. And then there was the opportunity that, you know, sometimes you have serendipity in your life. This was one of those moments. Somebody actually gifted me a blank notebook. This was when I was leaving Bombay and I was uh, moving out of the country for a little bit. And this person gifted this to me as a farewell gift. It was lying there and, you know, my stuff had been packed and I remember it was raining uh, at that point of time. And I decided to actually give that novel a shot. And I wrote the first few lines in that notebook. I just kept at it. The problem of many of these things is persistence. We tend to give up. All of us have little stories inside us. Most of us think about writing those stories. We don't actually write it. Because writing actually also is an and process. You have, you have the creative piece, which is about thinking of possibilities. You have that discipline piece, which is about sitting down and writing it. Finally, what I want to talk to you about is don't give up your hobbies. A lot of things that you do in your life will come from the hobbies that you have at some point of time tried out. Maybe you've nurtured them partially, maybe you haven't. I tried drawing, I tried calligraphy, I tried reading and writing. And then the whole question was, how do you combine all of that into the work that you do? When I tried bringing them in into my work, you know, I create these things which are called sketch notes. Every time I write something, I illustrate them like that. I use them in my slides, I use them in the articles that I write. And this actually gives me the opportunity to try out all the things that I do. You know, so drawing, writing, calligraphy, reading, all of that put together. I think the opportunity of formats is there with all of us. It's a question of not getting limited by your imagination. Whatever you want to do, there is an option to do this. How do we discover this prism? This prism is you. So when you go through your life, make sure you don't limit yourself. Because this life has immense amount of possibilities. Just because it hasn't been done before does not mean that connection does not exist. So here is hoping that all of you will today go back to your room, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I don't need a prism outside. I am the prism. When life enters through me, it is those possibilities that are going to open up. Thank you.